When the bride is a widow and the groom is a widower, when the former has lived in our great little town for hardly two years and the latter for hardly a month, when Monsieur wants to get the whole damned thing over with as quickly as possible, and Madame gives in with a tolerant smile, then, my reader, the wedding is generally a quiet affair. The bridemaid dispenses with a tiara of orange blossoms securing her fingertip veil, nor does she carry a white orchid in a prayer book. The bride's little daughter might have added to the ceremonies uniting age and age a touch of vivid vermeil, but I knew I would not dare be too tender with cornered Lolita yet, and therefore agreed it was not worth while tearing the child away from her beloved camp Q. My soi son, passionate and lonely Charlotte, was in everyday life matter-of-fact and gregarious. Moreover, I discovered that although she could not control her heart or her cries, she was a woman of principle. Immediately after she had become more or less my mistress, despite the stimulants her nervous, eager chéri, a heroic chéri, had some initial trouble for which, however, he amply compensated her by a fantastic display of old-world endearments, good Charlotte interviewed me about my relations with God. I could have answered that on that score my mind was open. I said instead, paying my tribute to a pious platitude, that I believed in a cosmic spirit. Looking down at her fingernails, she also asked me had I not in my family a certain strange strain. I countered by inquiring whether she would still want to marry me if my father's maternal grandfather had been, say, a Turk. She said it did not matter a bit, but that if she ever found out I did not believe in our Christian God, she would commit suicide. She said it so solemnly, solemnly that, I, that it gave me the creeps. It was then I knew she was a woman of principle. Oh, she was very genteel. She said, excuse me, whenever a slight burp interrupted her flowing speech, called an envelope an envelope, and when talking to her lady friends referred to me as Mr. Humbert. I thought it would please her if I entered the community trailing some glamour after me. On the day of our wedding, a little interview with me appeared in the society column on the Ramsdale Journal with a photograph of Charlotte, one eyebrow up and a misprint in her name, Hazer. Despite these contratemps, the publicity warmed the porcelain cockles of her heart and made my rattles shake with awful glee. By engaging in church work, as well as by getting to know the better mothers of Lowe's schoolmates, Charlotte, in the course of twenty months or so, had managed to become, if not a prominent, at least an acceptable citizen, but never before had she come under that thrilling rubric, and it was I who put her there, Mr. Edgar H. Humbert, I threw in the Edgar just for the heck of it, writer and explorer. McCoo's brother, when taking it down, asked me what I had written. Whatever I told him came out as several books on Peacock, Rainbow and other poets. It was also noted that Charlotte and I had known each other for several years and that I was a distant relation of her first husband. I hinted I had had an affair with her 13 years ago, but this was not mentioned in print. To Charlotte, I said that society columns should contain a shimmer of errors. errors. Let us go on with this curious tale. When called upon to enjoy my promotion from lodger to lover, did I experience only bitterness and uh, distaste? No. Mr. Humbert confesses to a certain titillation of his vanity, to some faint tenderness, even to a pattern of remorse daintily running along the steel of his conspirational dagger. Never had I thought 
that the rather ridiculous though rather handsome Mrs. Hayes, with her blind faith in the wisdom of her church and book club, her mannerisms of elocution, her harsh, cold, contemptuous attitude toward an adorable, downy-armed child of twelve could turn into such a touching, helpless creature as soon as I laid my hands upon her, which happened on the threshold of Lolita's room. With her, she tremulously backed, repeating, No, no, please no. The transformation improved her looks. Her smile that had been such a contrived thing thenceforth became the radiance of utter adoration. A radiance having something soft and moist about it, in which, with wonder, I recognized a resemblance to the lovely, inane, lost, lost look that Lowe had when gloating over a new kind of concoction at the soda fountain, or mutely admiring my expensive, always tailor fresh clothes. Deeply fascinated, I would watch Charlotte while she swapped parental woods with some older lady and made that national grimace of feminine resignation, eyes rolling up, mouth drooping sideways, which in an infantile form I had seen Low making herself. We had highballs before turning in, and with their help I would manage to evoke the child while caressing their mother. This was the white stomach within which my nymph had been a little curved fish in 1934. This carefully dyed hair, so sterile to my sense of smell and touch, acquired at a certain lamplit moments in the poster bed the tinge, if not the texture, of Lolita's curls. I kept telling myself, as I wielded my brand new largest life wife, that biological, biologically this was the nearest I could get to Lolita, that at Lolita's age Lot had been as desirable a schoolgirl as her daughter was, and as Lolita's daughter would be someday. I had my wife unearthed from under a collection of shoes. Mr. Hayes had a passion for them, it appears. A 30-year-old album so that I might see how Lot had looked as a child, and even though the light was wrong and the dresses graceless, I was able to make out a dim first version of Lolita's outline, legs, cheekbones, bobbed nose. Lotelita, Lolitchen. So I Tom peeped across, my, across the, ed, the hedges of years into one little window, and when, by means of pitifully ardent, naively lascivious caresses, she of the noble nipple and massive thigh prepared me for the performance of my nightly duty. It was still an infant's scent that in despair I tried to pick up, as I bade through the undergrowth of dark, decaying forests. I simply can't tell I simply can't tell you how gentle, how touching my poor wife was. At breakfast in the depressingly bright kitchen with its chrome glitter and hardware and co calendar and cute breakfast nook, simulating that coffee shop where in their college days Charlotte and Humbert used to co together, she could sit, robbed in red, her elbow on the plastic top table her cheek propped on her fist and stared at me with intolerable tenderness as I consumed my ham and eggs. Humbert's face might twitch with neuralgia, but in her eyes it vied in beauty and animation with the sun and shadows of leaves rippling on the white refrigerator. My solemn exasperation was to her the silence of love. My small income added to her even smaller one impressed her as a brilliant fortune. Not because the resulting sum now sufficed for most middle-class needs, 
but because even my money shone in her eyes with the magic of my manliness, and she saw our joint account as one of those southern boulevards at midday that have solid shade on one side and smooth sunshine on the other, all the way to the end of a prospect where pink mountains loom. Into the fifty days of our cohabitation, Charlotte crammed the activities of us many years. The poor woman busied herself with a number of things she had foregone long before, or had never been much interested in, as if to prolong these Prussian intonations, by my marrying the mother of the child I loved, I had enabled my life to regain an abundance of youth by proxy. With the zest with the zest of a banal young bride, she started to glorify the home. Knowing as I did, it's every cranny by heart, since those days went from my chair I mentally mapped out Lolita's curse through the house, I had long entered into a sort of emotional relationship with it, with its very ugliness and dirt, and now I could almost feel the wretched thing cower, cower in its reluctance to endure the bath of ecru and ocher and putty buff and snuff that Charlotte planned to give it. She never got as far as that, thank God, but she did use up a tremendous amount of energy in washing window shades, waxing the slats of Venetian, Venetian blinds, purchasing new shades and new blinds, returning them to the store, replacing them by others, and so on, in a constant chiaroscuro of smiles and frowns, doubts and pouts. She doubled in cretons and chintzes. She changed the colors of the sofa. She, uh, the sacred sofa where a bubble of paradise had once burst in slow motion within me. She rearranged the furniture and was pleased when she found in a household tree at ties that it is permissible to separate a pair of sofa commodes and their companion lamps. With the authoress of Your Home Is You, she developed a hatred for little lean chairs and spindle tables. She believed that a room having a generous expanse of glass and lots of rich wood paneling was an example of the masculine type of room, whereas the feminine type was characterized by lighter-looking windows and frailer woodwork. The novels I had found her reading when I moved in were now replaced by illustrated catalogues and homemaking guides from a firm located at 4640 Roosevelt Boulevard, Philadelphia. She ordered for our double bed a damask covered 312 coil mattress. Although the old one seemed to me resilient and durable enough for whatever it had to support. A Midwesterner, as her late husband had also been, she had lived in Coy Ramsdale, the gym of an eastern state, not long enough to know all the nice people. She knew slightly the jovial dentist who lived in a kind of uh, ramshackle with wooden chateau behind a lawn. She had met at church the, the snooty wife of the local junk dealer who owned the colonial white horror at the corner of the avenue. Now and then she visited, uh, she visited with old Miss Opposite, but the more patrician matrons among those she called upon or met at long functions or had telephone chats with such dainty ladies as Mrs. Glave, Mrs. Sheridan, Mrs. McChrystal, Mrs. Knight and others seldom seemed to call on my neglected Charlotte. Indeed, the only couple with whom she had relations of real cordiality, devoid of any arrière-pensée or practical foresight, were the Farlows, who had just come back from a business trip to Chile in time to attend our wedding, with the Shatfields, Macus, and a few others, but not Mrs. Junk or the even prouder Mrs. Talbot. John Farlow was a middle-aged, quiet, quietly athletic, quietly successful dealer in sporting goods, 
who had an office at Parkington, 40 miles away. It was, it was he who got me the cartridges for that cold and showed me how to use it during a walk in the woods one Sunday. He was also what he called with a smile a part-time lawyer and had handled some of Charlotte's affairs. Jean, his youngish wife and first cousin, <laughs> was a long-limbed girl in harlequin glasses with two boxer dogs, two pointed breasts and a big red mouth. She painted landscapes and portraits and vividly do I remember praising over cocktails the picture she had made of a niece of hers, little Rosalind Honeck, a rosy honey in a Girl Scout uniform, beret of green worsted, belt of green webbing, charming shoulder-long curls. And John removed his pipe and said it was a pity dolly, my, my dolita, and Rosalind were so critical of each other at school. But he hoped they would get on better when they returned from their respective camps. We talked of the school. It had its drawbacks and it has and it had its virtues. Of course, too many of the tradespeople here are Italians, said John. But on the other hand, we are still spared. I wish, interrupted Jean with a laugh, Dolly and Rosaline were spending the summer together. Suddenly I imagined Lowe returning from camp, brown, warm, drowsy drugged and was ready to weep with passion and impatience. <laughs>